Tonight, a rosy picture. Canada is, is, is an outsized uh, performer. Jobs for Canadians jump for a second month in a row, but the politics of it, with an election campaign looming, not so easy. Action! Many people who work for us will not want to work there. The politics of abortion hits the U.S. entertainment industry. How communities may feel the impact. I was very excited when I heard about they were coming here. And a popular wellness company opens a Canadian storefront, but then Goop got a visit from Health Canada. This is The National. An up and down day for Gwyneth Paltrow's global empire of lifestyle and wellness. It's known as Goop, and today it expanded into Canada with a pop-up store in Toronto. But after CBC News asked some questions, Health Canada pulled some products off Goop's shelves. I always have one in the morning and then one in my water bottle when I'm working out. So let's start by explaining a bit about Goop. The actor started it as a newsletter in 2008, but it really took off selling health and beauty products, and it did well for itself. Recently valued at a quarter billion dollars. But Goop has also been called out for some of its claims, like jade eggs that allegedly regulate menstrual cycles, or when Goop said its stickers promote healing using the same special carbon found in NASA spacesuits, except NASA announced there is no carbon in its spacesuits. Now today, Katie Nicholson visited Goop's Canadian outpost to see what they're selling, who's buying, and whether they know all they need to about Health Canada's regulations. Gwyneth Paltrow didn't come to the opening of her first Canadian store. She didn't need to. Let's go, go, go! Her Goop brand has star power all its own. I love that they're all about wellness and taking care of yourself. The fans filed in and filed out with the goods, promising a more fashionable life and better skin. Oh, it just moves around all of the fluids inside your face. But Goop enthusiasts weren't the only people who paid the store a visit. In a statement to CBC, Health Canada says its inspectors dropped by and they found two sunscreen products not approved for sale in Canada. Goop voluntarily removed them from its shelves. Since 2015, Health Canada has licensed more than 34,000 natural health products for sale. The products are tested to make sure they don't contain any surprises or harmful ingredients. And then they're assigned a natural product number, which appears on the label. Every year, the government rejects roughly 1,900 of these products. And while the rules for storefronts are strict, as Goop learned today, online, it's a different story. There's a loophole. Canadians can order any unlicensed natural health product online, so long as it's for personal use. We were able to order these two product lines from Goop.com, even though they're not approved for sale in stores in Canada. Transformational foods for a high vibration holistic lifestyle. What does that mean? <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> a high vibration lifestyle. Like, ooh. Then we have this one. Dr. Jen Gunter has made a second career fact-checking the health claims of Goop and its natural health products. I've never seen that. that she says so there is a risk when you buy unapproved supplements. So maybe they contain an antidepressant or they contain something that could interact with a medication that you're on and you could have a drug reaction. Health Canada didn't answer our questions about that online sales loophole. Protecting Canadians matters, then it should matter for all the potential sources that people could be exposed to these products. These Goop fans um, agree. Definitely I would, regulations on that. Absolutely. Okay, so Katie, well within the realm of possibility that people could own Goop products that are not approved by Health Canada, right? Could have been bought online or, or abroad. How do people check one way or the other? Okay, well, Health Canada maintains a natural product database. And essentially, you just plunk that into your browser, whatever browser you're using, and it, is a, it allows you to search by product ingredient, by, by brand name. So if you had some echinacea kicking around in your medicine cabinet and you weren't sure if maybe it's all echinacea or if it's approved by Health Canada, you can just put echinacea as an ingredient in there, boom, and it gives you every single product with echinacea in it that right. has been approved uh, by Health Canada. So it's a handy tool, and I'm sure that uh, you can have a lot of fun with it this weekend going through your medicine sure. calendar, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, very good to know, Katie. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Okay, job numbers for this past May are out today, and the news is good. The data from StatsCan helping confirm that the record-setting numbers from April were not a fluke. 
Canada is on a roll and unemployment seems to be on the run at its lowest rate in more than 40 years. But numbers are one thing. How the economy feels to Canadians, maybe another. We're going to be exploring both, starting with Jayla Bernstein. So we want to help you understand what kind of job it is you want. At this Montreal nonprofit, counselors guide people through the labyrinth of resumes and interviews. Looking for work is not easy. Though it could be worse. Our jobs numbers are sparkling. I, honestly, I look around the rest of the world, including the United States, where their jobs numbers just disappointed. And Canada is, is, is an outsized uh, performer in terms of the strength of our job markets for, for quite some time now. That paints a rosy picture, though the sheer number of options for some is overwhelming. There's just so many out there. And it's like, it takes so much time. And I would spend like up to five hours per day looking for jobs. And then I'm like, hey, that's enough for today. The numbers aren't translating into jobs for everyone. Newcomers is one, one example. Another example is chronically visible minority communities who, who, are, who are still, who unfortunately, are dealing with very high unemployment rates. The latest numbers suggest in May, many opted to be their own bosses. Some 62,000 people who identified as self-employed got jobs last month. In a country like Canada, the self-employed sector is hugely important. It's a very vibrant part of the economy in terms of creating jobs and creating economic activity. So when we see a number like that, it's a good underpinning to Main Street economic activity in the country. Staff here say whether you want to work for yourself or someone else, the key is to keep your skills current. I think the future is bright. Um, I think that um, you always have to be, you never, you know, lifelong learning now is the new buzzword, right? So even after you graduate, lifelong learning is what you should be doing. Though he warns against taking today's sunny skies for granted, he says the market can always change. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Montreal. Okay, now we have Vashi Capellas, host of CBC News' Power in Politics, joining us for more on the significance of this in Ottawa. So Vashi, this will all bode well for Justin Trudeau. Yeah, in theory, Andrew, Justin Trudeau should be able to tell Canadians as they head to the polls, hey, a million more of you are employed now than prior to my election. Except for the problem is a lot of Canadians are feeling like the big numbers aren't matching their own pocketbooks and they have a lot of insecurity about their own financial future. The prime minister is even acknowledging that. Take a listen. People are worried about their jobs, about their future. And unfortunately, um, there are many politicians who look for popularity given that anxiety and work to amplify or echo back those fears to people without actually offering solutions. Okay, so Trudeau wants to play this carefully. What about the opposition? Well, they kind of have to play it carefully, too. You've seen those ads during the Raptors games where they're sort of drilling down on that idea of economic insecurity, except for the numbers, as we've been talking about, don't back that up. So they're going to have a kind of tough slodge ahead trying to mishmash those messages together for the electorate as we head into the election campaign, too. Andrew? Okay. Vashi Capellas, thanks so much. The U.S. has been consumed for days with an economic story of its own. Donald Trump has been threatening to impose tariffs on Mexico unless it strengthens its border security. And Monday, this coming Monday, was supposed to be the deadline when the hammer would drop. But then, this evening, news of a deal. The CBC's Ellen Morrow has been watching this situation for us in Washington. Ellen, what do we know about the agreement? Well, Andrew, talks between Mexico and the United States have been going on for days. And late this evening, a deal was reached. President Trump breaking the news on his Twitter account, saying those tariffs on all Mexican imports that were supposed to start on Monday have been indefinitely suspended. Uh, we got more details from the Mexican foreign minister on the agreement him itself. He said Mexico will deploy troops to its southern border, trying to prevent Central American migrants from coming north. He he also said that migrants who are waiting for their U.S. asylum claims to be processed will be allowed to wait in Mexico. The American hope being that would take some pressure off the border and off of border uh, communities. The foreign minister also said Mexico will try to dismantle human smuggling rings in the country. So those measures, among others in the agreement, were enough to satisfy President Trump that Mexico will do more to stop migrants from crossing the border. And that number, uh, Andrew, Andrew is growing. More than 130,000 people were apprehended in the border or at the border in May alone. That's the highest monthly total in 13 years. And Ellen, you know, Mexico didn't want to see those tariffs clearly, but many Americans didn't want to see them either. 
No, that's right. And this worked to be a, worked out to be a win for President Trump in two ways. He gets to say to his base that he got Mexico to do more, and he gets to say to his party, I did not impose these tariffs. He's been under a lot of pressure from fellow Republicans over the last few days, including some who are usually vocal supporters of his, who said, don't go ahead, don't impose these tariffs. They would be a tax on American businesses and consumers. So again, President Trump, uh, a win here on both sides, both for his base and his party. A developing story tonight. Good stuff. Ellen Morrow in Washington. Thanks. Now, even with this announcement, we do know that Donald Trump does like tariffs as a tactic, even if he sometimes seems to forget who actually has to pay them, American consumers. And while his supporters might argue that people are still better off, even with tariffs, thanks to Trump's huge tax cut in 2017, well, let's take a look at that. Those cuts gave middle-income households an average of $930. 2018 tariffs on Chinese goods cost each household about $831. But now add proposed tariffs on $300 billion worth of Chinese goods, the household bill would grow to about $2,300, which would be more than double that $930 tax cut. Okay, let's turn now to the biggest night yet for Raptors fans, for now, at least. Andrew, Game 4 of the NBA Finals has had Raptors fans everywhere hopeful and probably a little nervous. This is a live look at Jurassic Park. Do these people look nervous? Uh, near the Raptors' home arena, fans packed in tight once again. This time, though, watching an away game on the big screens. And once again this evening, our Greg Ross is on the road. He's just outside Oakland's Oracle Arena. And Greg, you've talked to some Raps fans. How are they feeling about tonight? Well, they have to be feeling pretty good. Right now at the half, the Raptors are trailing by just four in a half that uh, Golden State has led almost all of. But uh, the Raptors getting a good performance from their star, Kawhi Leonard, who has 14 points. On the other side of the court, though, you've got Clay Tom uh, Thompson, who also has 14 points coming back after that injury. So a close one at the half. But lots of these fans, lots of Raptor fans here from coast to coast, they're using social media to connect, and they're meeting, and it's a pretty interesting story. Let's go Raptors! We love so you organized this whole WhatsApp group. We did. We all did. You know what? And look at this. This doesn't feel like a Royal Oracle Arena. This looks like Scotiabank Arena. We love we love From Victoria Island to Saskatoon, Saskatchewan to PEI, coast to coast, we all feel the same way, and it's a brotherhood. It's a national thing. Everyone's introducing themselves. Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary, Nova Scotia, Sudbury, Vegas, everywhere, right? Yeah, it's, it's gotten out of control, but in a good way. Let's go Raptors! We got North! So it really is incredible just how these fans have connected, and it, it really is incredible how this team has become Canada's team, Ian. So lots of red jerseys in there in that sea of yellow jerseys for the Golden State Warriors, and lots of loud cheers for the Raptors when they score as well. And there will be many more if the Raptors can come back and win this game. I was going to say, everywhere I see you, Greg, there are people surrounding you cheering. Let's hope that that's the story when we check back with you in about an hour. Well, no matter what happens in these finals, the Warriors are one of the greatest teams in the NBA. They've been the champs three times in four years. Impressive for a squad once considered a league also ran. But as Kim Brunhuber explains, the team's local fans are about to pay a steep price for all that recent success. And when they were done, they read it again. Golden State Warriors forward Alfonso McKinney is reading to a group of children in an East Oakland community center. Most of the kids live in a rough part of town in one of the most violent cities in the country. A team making a difference in a needy neighborhood. This is the story the Golden State Warriors want to tell about themselves. But there's another story on everyone's minds here in Oakland, and they all know how it ends. No. No. Next year, it's likely these players will be spending time with a different group of kids in the much richer city across the bay. And according to many here in Oakland, that will leave a void in the city's struggling African-American community. I feel like going to the mall and buy a whole new chain up you know, one time. Uh. Mr. Fab, whose real name is Stanley Cox, like at the Warriors games, bag. and he goes to like almost all of them, they call him Front Row Fabby. He's basically the Warriors' less famous version of Drake. 
As the team's fortunes have risen, so too has the cost of living in Oakland. Silicon Valley's gilded shadow is spreading across the bay, making it harder for almost everyone who isn't employed in the tech sector. The fact that the Warriors and the city's NFL team will have relocated to richer cities within a few years of each other, he says, is just making things worse. Hundreds and hundreds of people that work won't have a job. Most of those people are African-American and um, Latino-American. Right here, we're in Mosswood Park, right in the middle of Oakland, California, and uh, this is a legendary basketball court. Liam O'Donohue hosts a podcast on Oakland history. We're standing on a court which the Warriors helped refurbish. O'Donohue says the team's move reflects the racial gentrification happening more broadly in the Bay Area. The Warriors are only moving about 16 kilometers away, but O'Donohue says it might as well be 16,000. A lot of black folks came out to support the Warriors even when they weren't doing well. And now that tickets are, you know, three, four, five hundred dollars a pop and up next year, starting at Chase Stadium, I don't think you're going to see that kind of diversity in the stands. The Warriors promise they won't abandon Oakland, but many here fear once they cross the Bay Bridge, they won't turn back. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Oakland, California. Now to a troubling story here in Vancouver. It's about Tracy Gunderson, who died alone in her apartment last year, and the questions being raised by her daughter about the circumstances surrounding the death. Gunderson was bleeding badly due to a medical condition, but first responders didn't get to her in time. Val Puri picks up our story. Thinking about her mother's death makes Chelsea Brent furious. I don't even have a word for it. Like, it's, it blows my mind. It makes me beyond angry. Last November at her Vancouver apartment, Tracy Gunderson died while frantically begging for help. At 8.15 that morning, she made her last phone call to 911. BC Ambulance for what city, please? Vancouver, I'm what? bleeding for you. Hang on, what's the address you need help to, ma'am? An ambulance was dispatched. Tell me when the paramedics get there, okay? How am I going to get to the bathroom? Within five minutes, paramedics were at the front door of the building. I right can't open you. the door. You said it's unlocked, though, is that right? Yeah, but the buzzer. You can't get to the buzzer. Okay. Okay, just stay on the line with me here. We're going to figure out a way in, okay? Oh, my God. The call was deemed non-life-threatening. That means an ambulance was dispatched, not fire. BC's year-old emergency dispatch system sends ambulance and fire only to what are deemed the most critical calls. But it's only fire that has access to the lockbox that lets you into multi-unit buildings. So what we don't want is two resources tied up on one incident where they're going to arrive approximately the same time. The new policy has reportedly led to a 30% drop in medical calls to the fire department. One of the, the main tenets of emergency response is to send as many resources as you can within reason to an incident and then scale it back as needed. 35 minutes after the 911 call, paramedics finally got to Tracy Gunderson. They found her lying by her window, unresponsive, no pulse, and they were unable to resuscitate her. I don't know if she would have lived 100%, like I don't know her health and if she would have made it if fire had been there right away. But what I do know is no, one, no person should call for help and not receive it. The provincial government has ordered an independent review of the case. Bell Puri, CBC News, Vancouver. Still ahead on The National, from your TV screens to real-life political protests, our pop panel takes on The Handmaid's Tale. But first, why Hollywood is threatening to leave Georgia. I mean, it's like a slap in the face. Really? Why? Not just for women, but generally, because we want to work anywhere you want to work. You want to make sure that your rights are intact. As the head of Disney, Bob Iger may have the spending cloud to make Georgia think twice about its looming anti-abortion law. When it takes effect in January, it will make the procedure illegal once a fetal heartbeat is detected as early as six weeks. Well, I think if it becomes law, uh, it'll be very difficult to produce it. I rather doubt we will. Many people who work for us will not want to work there and um, we'll have to heed their wishes. Other production giants have openly considered a boycott. In just one year, they can inject more than $9 billion into the state economy. Eli Glasner went to Georgia and found the start of a production chill, but some people working in the industry want to stay and fight. 
So they shot Baby Driver around here? They did, actually right, right up the street here. We met location manager Kalina Bowler just outside of Atlanta. Baby Driver is just one of the many movies and TV shows filmed in the state. You want bigger? Avengers and Watchmen have been fighting for studio space. So, things doing great? Yeah. Industry chugging along? Yeah. Then this heartbeat bill comes in. I mean, it's like a slap in the face. Really? Why? Not just for women, but generally, because we want to work anywhere you want to work. You want to make sure that your rights are intact. We are called to be strong and courageous. When Governor Brian Kemp signed the bill banning abortions after six weeks, Hollywood pushed back. Many major studios and networks said they may leave if the bill becomes law in January. If your A-listers and your above-the-line crew members don't want to bring their business to Georgia, us below-the-line crew members, you know, we're kind of left in the lurch a bit. A lot of us don't have that easy mobility. Callie Moore moved to Georgia from Louisiana when the 30% tax breaks supercharged the industry. But the boycott could force her out, so she's channeling her frustrations into the Stay and Fight Georgia campaign, which has already raised $10,000 to support legal challenges against the bill. Our crew specifically, as soon as we mentioned trying to do something positive and fight back against uh, the abortion ban and the, the boycott as well, there was like a sense of relief and positivity. Drive an hour south of Atlanta and you come to the idyllic town of Sonoy. This is Sonoy, a small Georgian town, better known to fans of The Walking Dead as the background to much of the series. In fact, the population here in Sonoy has doubled since the zombie show got started. But now that the network behind the show, AMC, is saying they will reevaluate activity in the state if the abortion bill goes ahead, well, Sonoy's future could be uncertain. Y'all enjoying yourself here in Woodbury? This tour guide dressed as a Walking Dead character says they owe the show a lot. Before The Walking Dead came here, we only had five businesses on Main Street. Today, right. we have over 51 businesses, and we have more growing all the time. Down the street, jewelry store owner Jan Hip is worried, but thinks Hollywood should butt out. Well, of course it wouldn't be a good, a good thing for us. I mean, we could use the business, but on the other hand, why does an industry like that think they can come and tell us what our laws should be in Georgia? While the law doesn't go into effect until January, this Atlanta film industry journalist says the damage is already done. Even if this bill doesn't come into effect and if the courts block it, I think a lot of producers say Georgia is off the table or just not going to even consider it. Action! Until then, the TV and film industry is a little like The Walking Dead, trying to survive as the battle between the bill and boycott shuffles forward. Eli Glasper, CBC News, Atlanta, Georgia. And just ahead on The National, our Friday pop panel looks at The Handmaid's Tale and whether the protests it spurred might run out of steam. And later in our moment, a Canadian soldier finally laid properly to rest 75 years after his death. It's just amazing to be able to honour him and honour all the other men and women that are here and have served for our country. Blessed be the fruit. The Handmaid's Tale, Margaret Atwood's classic dystopian novel turned hit TV series, is back for its third season this week. And it's also made its return to real life protests, like the one in London against US President Donald Trump's state visit. Margaret Atwood's novel is a complete classic, but I think the TV show is really just a TV show. You know, it's an escapist fantasy like any show. The cultural impact of The Handmaid's Tale, I think, is its uncanny ability to mirror reality. Across the United States, reproductive rights are facing extraordinary challenges. Let's just say it all makes me do that kind of uncomfortable laugh that sounds a little bit like crying. I'm Katie Underwood, freelance writer and editor. I'm Stephen Marsh, random Toronto writer. I'm Stacey Lee Kong, freelance writer and editor. The TV show launched soon after the Trump presidency began, and it quickly became a way for people to make jabs at his administration, like this one at his press secretary. I have to say, I'm a little starstruck. I love you as Aunt Lydia and The Handmaid's Tale. It has turned out that pop culture resistance, resistance through television shows, isn't really resistance at all. It's radically ineffective as resistance, actually. The gift of The Handmaid's Tale is that it's entertainment that doubles as a form of accountability. If you're into a show that depicts the systematic disenfranchisement of women, maybe you'll start realizing it when it happens in real life. 
and maybe you'll even do something about it. Okay, if you've seen neither the series nor read the book, here's a taste of season one. I was asleep before. That's how we let it happen. When they slaughtered Congress, we didn't wake up. When they blamed terrorists and suspended the Constitution, we didn't wake up then either. Now I'm awake. My name is Alfred. I had another name. Ladies, I have to let you go. It's the law now. They needed to do it this way. All the bank accounts and the jobs all at the same time. Can you imagine the airports otherwise? Run, run, run! Okay, so that imagery, we saw it in Trafalgar Square a few days ago. Same thing during Trump's visit to the UK the year before. Even at Brett Kavanaugh's Supreme Court confirmation hearing, at protests all over the United States, around the world, there's even a handmaid's coalition complete with a guidebook on how to make your own crimson cloak and white bonnet. <laughs> Katie, what, it, what is it about that costume and the idea behind it that we see it again and again and again? Um, well, I think, you know, every social movement needs some kind of iconography, and I think the timing and the actual visual of this is such a statement. So whether it's the bonnet that kind of obscures the faces of the women, which kind of connotes a facelessness and anonymity where women can be interchangeable in Gilead, which is a society that has essentially been sterilized um, and subjugated women for literally forced labor. So there's that aspect, but then there's the pop of red, which kind of, to me at least, signifies a spark against this very sterile landscape. And the red, you know, obviously it makes you think of blood, it makes you think of, you know, disorder in some way. And Stephen, I mean, it is kind of, you know, Atwood's disturbing dystopia mm. brought alive. This is, a, this is a television show with a great look. And when we talk about its political effects, I think we should remember that that's what it is and that's, how, that's what it's always gonna be. It's just a television show with a great look. Right, but okay, but is there power behind the look, right? No, I mean, it, it... there isn't. You know, there's, there's power behind the look, but it doesn't actually change anything in power. I mean, we're coming through a period where, uh, you know, if you were to ask me, like, what has The Handmaid's Tale done to change gender roles in society, there is nothing that you can say it has changed. Okay, well, okay, but, but is that setting the bar a little high, right? I mean, the, the, the costume in a protest, I suspect that the, the main objective is just to articulate rejection, uh, defiance, and if it does that, doesn't it accomplish the goal? I don't know. I mean, I think uh, it's a huge assumption among our, you know, pop culture commentators and our political commentators too, I think, that pop culture politics is actually having this big effect mm. on the world. And the truth is that what we've seen over three years, and before then, even from the Obama years, sure. is that we're in this middle of this great pop culture revolution in terms of progressive politics, and at the same time, we're dealing with a period where women's rights are being pulled back in a way that we haven't really seen since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Really. Stacey, is, is, what do you think I of I disagree completely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then, then I in, just please. don't agree. So I think that it's, it's kind of an interesting position to take that to say that the t a TV show or pop culture doesn't have any sort of political influence because we have seen so many examples of when it has. Protest songs are a great example of how pop culture and politics intersect. I take what you mean that, okay, no, I can't trace a direct line between the handmaids in their costumes and some kind of actual understanding of gender roles that, like, or change laws. legislation. Yeah, legislation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But... I think opinions are a big part of that, and I think shaping messages is a big part of that. But and opinions are going the other way, too. Is, is the costume, so, so clearly you think the costume is effective, at I least as a tool in I the toolbox of I think it's a, as protest. effective as a tool. I think it has made an impact. I don't think it's like this perfect solution, mm -hmm. but I do think it seems, to me it seems weird to act as if a TV show is unserious and doesn't apply to serious things. Is the costume as effective today as it was, say, two years that ago? That I don't think. No. I feel like... And there's an, a couple of reasons for this, but I feel like early on it felt really clever, right? It felt like this is a really perfect encapsulation of how we feel the world is going to go. Now that the world has gone that way, it doesn't feel as clever. Margaret Atwood, so, so in an interview, this was mm -hmm. interesting, she said about the story, none of it's made up. People have done these things, and what people have done once, mm -hmm. they are quite capable of doing again. So Katie, you know, we, we see quite clearly the success of the show spin off into real life, mm -hmm. right? In, in the form of these, these costumes at these protests. Mm -hmm. I wonder to, to what extent is credit owed the other way, in the sense that the, the show is only successful because of the time that we live in, this, this sort of tumultuous political time? 
Well, I think it's kind of hard to tease the, those two things apart because the show launched, you know, months, six months or so after Donald Trump got into office. So obviously they had been filming that for a long time. I don't think they had a lot of lead time and, you know, could right. see or foresee what would eventually happen. Which is an important point, right? Like, exactly. like the series was greenlit long before Donald Trump was yeah. even considered a, a viable contender. Yeah, no, but I it do. was greenlit in the middle of progressive yeah. politics yeah. taking over pop culture, sure. which was, happened well before Trump. Yeah, I will say that I think the thing to note is that Margaret Atwood wrote this in 1985, and the fact that these events have been true throughout history and are still true um, kind of bears out the fact that she has an, a, an incredible ability as someone in pop culture to not only foresee possibly what's going to happen or maybe just, like, talk about what's happened before and warn us against what's happening again. Um, I don't want to call it a happy coincidence because it's certainly not a happy show, but I do think there's um, credence to the fact that it's it's become popularized and become what it is in this moment. Yeah, the timing's pretty good. Well, yeah, I mean, is the timing good, though, in terms of what it wants its goals to be? I mean, I think the thing that's so amazing about this particular adaptation is it really shows the difference between a novel, what a novel can do and what television can do. Because, you know, novel, Atwood's novel is this real masterpiece about the power of private language. I mean, that's ultimately what it's about. It's this diary of this woman who, whose form of resistance is really this personal insistence on her own meaning. And when you translate that into television, like what television is, is just mass consumption. And ultimately, it doesn't have the same power. But it doesn't have the same power to change people. It doesn't have the same power to change ideas because, you know, ultimately, it is spectacle. And, 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 the, and the rules of spectacle, as we've seen, as we've seen through this entire period of woke spectacle, that has coincided with the greatest pullback of progressive political action in, you know, in our lifetime. Katie, do you want to? Yeah, I would disagree because I think that um, those two things are discrete. The fact that they're rolling back rights and that a TV show is progressive. They, they're not related to each other. But the idea of progression in society is inherently rooted in mass meaning. So I think you actually do have the most potential to create change in something like a television see, show. I think this is actually a huge error that we've seen, we've seen disproved now. Like this has been the assumption for many years that we're going to have we're going to we're going to teach people through television we're going to teach them through these through pop culture through through music but actually what's happened is like we've got they've gotten the laws like right now in Georgia women are on the brink of being able to lose the right to have an abortion Hollywood is saying we're going to pull out of Georgia it makes no difference it's made no difference at all I mean I really think it's time for progressive people to wake up and realize that like the, the, this this thing that we've said, which is like pop culture is going to change the world, like no, it's not. It's doing the opposite. It's, so th this is kind of an interesting <laughs> point, and I, and I want to hear what you two think about this. This idea that is there or isn't there, kind of like an ongoing relationship between the series as we see it, and you know some some narrow slice of the real life protest. Does does the success of one? hinge now on the, on the success of the other. I don't know that it does, because I think a lot of progressives that I've sort of read their pieces or, or talked to haven't necessarily stuck with the show. I think the whether the show is successful or whether the show goes for one more season or 10 more seasons, I don't know that the success of the movement hinges on that. It's the same as, remember V is for Vendetta and all of a sudden everyone was wearing those Guy Fox, Guy masks, Fox masks and then Anonymous mm -hmm. co-opted them. Works. and Well, okay, so this... <laughs> <laughs> so this is where I hate to say this, Stephen, but I do get what you're saying, is that it's not that you can say there's a direct line between, look, here's an effective costume and here is successful legislation. But I think there's a value in this type of language and giving people language, right? And mm -hmm. in, in letting people who maybe haven't thought about these things a whole lot giving them a framework so they can understand. To what end? Th they wore this costume to Brett Kavanaugh's hearing. Brett Kavanaugh's gonna be in power for the rest of his life, and, yeah. and the costumes are gonna be forgotten in six months. But I still, this, I is what we, this is how we are losing. This is how we are losing, because we've, we've, put the, we've, we've made pop culture this battlefield for virtue and, and for political progress, and it, and it just isn't so. It's not the only thing. It can't be the only thing. Yeah. And then, Katie, you want to jump in here? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean, I, I think you can't excise one from society. We're, we're stuck with both, and I think they both have different roles. Pop culture, like Stacey was saying, is very much a language. It speaks to what's going on, and it also provides a language for people to speak back to what's going on. So it may not be that the people in the bonnets are the ones making the laws, but they're providing a vernacular for people who are watching the people make the laws to 
maybe discuss issues that but, they're not but typically they don't. involved in. Uh, guys, we're going to have to put a stop to it there. <laughs> I think we could have gone a lot longer, but thank you very much. Thank Pleasure. you. Still ahead on The National, navigating business with Russia, could the fear be receding? Some Canadian businesses seem to think so. We've seen our membership actually grow over the last two years because companies uh, uh, know that in this climate, uh, they can still make money. But first, this Sunday on The National, a conversation with whistleblower Edward Snowden about privacy and the impact of his actions. Here's a preview. Considering how precious privacy is, at what point do you ask yourself if what you did was worth it or made a difference? Well, I, I think the thing here is um, it's led to legal reforms in the United States, in Canada, uh, basically every country in Europe. We have the entire way the internet does business, which is surveillance capitalism, uh, coming under pressure and, and beginning to change. Um, everyone, even actually, ironically, uh, officials in the National Security Agency that, that condemned me uh, have said this was a good thing. Uh, this was something they themselves should have admitted years prior, and then it wouldn't have been a scandal because they would have had clean hands. Here are some other stories we're following tonight. Venezuela has hit a grim milestone. More than 4 million people have fled the South American nation amid its deepening humanitarian crisis. UN officials say about half of that total has sought shelter in Colombia and Peru, but a significant number has continued north to the Caribbean, Mexico and the US. The rate is believed to have increased in recent months. Tonight, Nicolas Maduro announced a partial reopening of Venezuela's border with Colombia. Meanwhile, Foreign Affairs Minister Christian Freeland met with her Cuban counterpart today and stressed the island nation has a role to play in Venezuela's return to democracy. I believe we are seeing an international convergence around the need for a peaceful transition in Venezuela. The U.S. accuses Cuba of propping up the Maduro regime. That puts Havana at odds with most Western countries, including Canada, which supports opposition leader Juan Guaido. Theresa May has formally resigned as leader of UK's ruling Conservative Party. She will stay on as Prime Minister, though, until a replacement is found. So far, 11 Conservative candidates are set to enter the race, which officially begins Monday. The new Prime Minister will be announced the week of July 22nd. And Russia and the United States blaming each other after two warships nearly collided in the Pacific. Reports say they came somewhere between 15 and 50 meters of each other, both sides saying their ship had to make emergency maneuvers to avoid colliding. The U.S. says it will lodge a formal diplomatic complaint. Russia likes to do things big, and the economic summit this week in St. Petersburg, no exception. It is a huge event with business leaders from around the world, including some from Canada. The Kremlin is trying to signal that Western sanctions have had little effect, that Russia is open for investment. But as Chris Brown reports, there are reasons to be hesitant. Crippling Western economic sanctions haven't stopped the Putin government from putting on a glitzy business spectacle this week in St. Petersburg, featuring an important guest of honor. Chinese leader Xi Jinping toured Vladimir Putin's hometown by boat, and notably, unlike the United States, Russia welcomed telecom giant Huawei as its partner. The United States extends their laws across the whole world, complained Putin, taking a shot at the sanctions against his country and also the U.S. tariffs against his guest as well. Russia has turned to China to make up for lost Western investment. But despite a big Chinese presence here, the reality is Chinese investment in Russia has so far been tepid. They weren't always friends. Canadian Lou Nomofsky has been investing and advising in Russia since the Gorbachev era. I think it's a mutual kind of respect, but uh, uh, hesitation and, uh, and, 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 and uh, special care about not going too deeply, too quickly. Putin's pitch is for foreigners to join in on an enormous $400 billion stimulus program to help address falling Russian incomes and growing public frustration with the economy. 
Canadian businesses are, of course, invited to invest in Russia too, and there are about a dozen or so here, though they're pretty sensitive about it. Paul Rowlandson, the CEO of Vancouver-based Kinross Gold, spoke on a panel about his company's two Russian mines, but he didn't want to talk to us. Still, the head of the local Canadian Business Association said, hopefully, the fear factor of doing business in Russia is receding. Uh, we've seen our membership actually grow over the last two years because companies uh, uh, know that in this climate, uh, they can still make money. Perhaps, but the story of American Michael Calvi undercuts that positive message. The most successful Western investor in Russia, Calvi was thrown in jail in February and now awaits trial on questionable fraud charges. His treatment has spooked many here and severely undermined Putin's claim that Russia is a safe place to invest. Chris Brown, CBC News, St. Petersburg. And up next, honoring a Canadian soldier 75 years after his death. How one family finally got the closure they needed today. My mom grew up not knowing who her dad was. It was always a touchy subject with her. So when we pulled in this morning, a lot of thoughts about my mom. Sergeant John Albert Collis' story is next in our moment. But first... The International Space Station is open for commercial business. In case you missed it, NASA is inviting space tourists to go way up, all the way to the International Space Station. For private astronauts to visit the space station on U.S. vehicles and for companies to engage in commercial profit-making activities on the station. Sounds futuristic, but NASA is actually late to this game. Personally, I've had the time of my life. Russia has been making money off space travel for years, hosting tourists. Molokov cosmos, not as a gnoll. And even in 1998, using one of its astronauts in an Israeli ad for milk. <laughs> NASA is planning to host two tourists next year for up to a month each. If you look at the pricing and you add it up back of the napkin, it will be roughly about $35,000 a night. And while the stay will be pricey, consider the airfare. They'll be riding on private launch vehicles like SpaceX's Dragon capsule at an expected cost of about 50 million a seat. And truth is, this is not the safest vacation. That Dragon capsule just blew up in testing in April. Its failure rate is one in 20 launches. But if you're extremely wealthy, have a passion for space, and maybe a mild death wish, NASA is now ready for you. Drag is my political statement. Come on. Let's make a scene. Drag is about creating safe spaces. I didn't choose how I felt. I only had a choice to do something about the way that I felt. I want them to love me. I want them to love drag. Nearly 75 years after his death, Sergeant John Albert Collis has been laid to rest. He was a Canadian soldier who died a few weeks into the Battle of Normandy during the Second World War. But it was only two years ago that his remains were discovered and identified using DNA analysis and dental records. Then, in April, the family got a phone call. His remains would be put to rest in the Canadian War Cemetery in France. That happened today, and it's our moment. It's just amazing to be able to honor him and honor all the other men and women that are here and have served for our country. We thought this was the best thing ever. Like, it's, a, it's truly an amazing experience. My mom grew up not knowing who her dad was. It was always a touchy subject with her. So when we pulled in this morning, a lot of thoughts about my mom went through my mind. And the fact that I could actually be here to honor her is really special to us. It just really shows how, how proud our country is and how proud they are of these veterans, that they were willing to go through this entire process all At these years such later. A, such, a, such a young age. For sure, for sure. To give up their tomorrows for our todays is a real honourable thing that every soldier or men and women have done for us, and in particular, my grandfather. And Ian, just, just think how all of this would have started. What was unearthed were skeletal remains and a ring with Sergeant Collis' initials on them. And, and so would begin a 75-year journey that, that I'm betting took a fair bit of care, dedication, 
and maybe a little bit of luck too. And you know, Andrew, a couple of other things strike me. First of all, you hear about these kinds of ceremonies and, and you wonder what kind of impact it has on the family. And even a couple of generations later, we heard it really does matter to them. Also watching the video of that cemetery, I've been there, lots of Canadians have. It is so moving to see all those uh, headstones and think of all those stories. And, and here's one more. He was 28 years old when he died. And of course, his daughter growing up without ever really knowing him. That is the National for June the 7th. Good night. Good night.